All right. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, do we feel energized after our tea coffee? I hope you all have received your hampers outside. And now we proceed to our first panel discussion, which is titled Unlocking Employee Potential, Designing Benefits that Empower and Engage. We have a stellar panel with us today who will explore various aspects of employee benefits, technology's role, and the future trends in this space. So without further ado, uh, may I call upon our first panelist, Mr. Ganesh Chandan, Chief Human Resources Officer for Tata Projects. May we have a big round of applause for Mr. Chandan as he comes on stage. And as our panelists come, I would request them to take the chairs under their photographs so it's easier that way, I guess. Next, we have Ms. Sonal Jain, Global CHRO for EPL Limited, who has also had an extensive career with Unilever. A big round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Amit Sharma, Head of HR Revenue, Z Music and Z Studios, and Head of Central HR. We also have with us Mr. Alok Ranjan, Head of Employee Experience for Bennett Coleman Company Limited, Times of India Group. A round of applause for him. Next, we have Ms. Rita Verma, President and Head HR for DDB Mudra Group. I hear the applause fading away slowly. Can we just energize and give a huge round of applause to all of them? Next, we have Ms. Talji Muliel, Director HR and Corporate Communication for Cargo Soul. And our final panelist for today, for this session, is Mr. Dev Arora, CEO of CPG Business for Chai Point. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to moderate this discussion, I would request Mr. Vipul Oberoi, Director of Marketing, CSR, and Learning Solutions for Dun & Bradstreet India to take the stage. Over to you, Mr. Oberoi. Hello everyone. Am I audible? Yeah. The mics always make me a bit conscious. I don't know whether they're working fine or not. Uh, so thank you everyone for uh, uh, all of us getting together here to understand the future workplace here. And we have a very uh, elite panel here coming from various sectors, from uh, logistics to uh, F&B and uh, from uh, manufacturing. So it's a very interesting way to see how workplaces are evolving in every sector. Uh, I am reminded of uh, what uh, in HR we used to read about Herzberg's theory about hygiene and motivation factors. And uh, probably Herzberg would have thought differently today because earlier he had said that there are hygiene factors and motivation factors which are totally exclusive to each other. Now that has become extremely vague. We don't know that uh, what is hygiene and what is something which would really motivate people. And I think uh, what we have gathered here is to understand which one of these should we really focus on. And uh, as uh, eminent HR and business leaders in your organizations, uh, you also have a very big responsibility on uh, motivating the people. Because I, I think at the end of the day, whatever you talk about technology, AI, etc., nothing can replace human intelligence, nothing can replace the human effort, and people are the crux, uh, the soul of any organization. So what we'll start with, it's an interesting thing, what we did in the past few days. We had ran a poll, and uh, in, it's a public poll that we ran, and uh, we asked people on what are the employee benefits that they really value. So this is something which we'll kind of test our panelists also on. So uh, I'll just use that clicker. Yeah. 
So for this uh, benefit of the panelists, I'll uh, run the question with you. So among these benefits uh, listed below, which are the top two benefits employee value for themselves? So there is uh, career development opportunities, competitive compensation packages, uh, facilitation of new age technologies, flexible work arrangement, health and wellness benefits, performance linked remuneration bonus, supporting financial well-being or workspace. What do you think? And these are something which we already know. These are the benefits which people seek. But if you have to set top two benefits, what would the, our panelists say are the top two benefits? The flexible work arrangement and health and wellness benefits. Okay, okay. That's, that's Ganesh from Tata. <laughs> Tata. Uh, sorry, uh, Amit from Z uh, says uh, agrees with this. In fact, order. Uh, Dave, anything from your experience? Would you like to take the mic? I think uh, they are really in order. Health and ben uh, wellness benefit has really come up, especially post-pandemic, hmm. and that is the main concern. Uh, and of course, the flexible work arrangement is the key. Uh, driving factor these days. Dev? Uh, well, uh, I agree to your thought, but the question also should have been linked with one component of generation. So huh. I would have been better, <laughs> easy way to answer. But because the Pretty points true. which I see, it is generation-wise. Maybe the first two points, maybe the X generation would have been okay with. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the career development opportunities and performance linked remunerations, the Y and the upcoming generations would have been more accepting to it. Okay. Sure. So that's my thoughts. Sure. Dave? No, I fully agree with what, uh, what Ma'am just said. I also feel that the Gen Z, when you see the tenure that they spend in an organization is very limited. And where they see the career development opportunities, where they see the competitive package, where they see the remuneration which is linked with their performance in a way, uh, I think that's the best retention tool right now. Okay. Other things are given for them, for Gen Z. For a slightly earlier generation, mm -hmm. it might not be given. So it's, they still value it, So is what I believe. So needs, must have, good to have, these always keep changing with generation to generation. So what are the survey results? So our survey result says that people prefer flexible work arrangement the most. So what you see are, so 35% uh, actually said flexible work arrangement is, among, is their first choice. 17% said second choice and 16% said uh, is their third choice. So in this order, what you see, flexible work arrangement, career development opportunities, and if we can say competitive compensation packages are actually the three most valued uh, uh, employee benefits. So, uh, Ganesh, let me start. Uh, is our audience also in sync with this? Any thoughts, sir? So, uh, Ganesh, uh, with you, uh, what are the employee benefits which you feel? And we are talking about Gen X, Gen Z, Gen Y, and it's always changing. How do you think employee benefits have evolved over the past, say, five years? I think the, there's a big difference between uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID. And uh, post-COVID, workplaces have drastically, suddenly changed, and they continue to evolve. And uh, I think for some more time, we will continue to be in an exploratory phase, uh, experiment with a lot of new ideas, new approaches for some more time, mm -hmm. before we finally arrive at what is a well-evolved, well-settled, uh, workplace of future. What we realize and what we recognize is that there, there's less emphasis on any benefit that is purely material in nature that continue to exist for a very long time. Say, for example, in many traditional organizations, you would continue to see, you know, a policy for car loan, vehicle loan, or some kind of, you want to buy furniture, or laptop, cell phones. We, we also had all of that. During COVID, we said all these things that you would anyway buy if you want them, if you really need them, you will find out ways and means to buy them. And there are plenty of uh, uh, banks and NBFCs who will offer you uh, fairly attractive interest rates, etc. And you'll always find ways to buy them. But people are not really investing in their health, in taking care of themselves, in their own wellness. 
and I'm not even talking about the mental well-being, I'm still talking about the physical well-being. We do come across many instances, we read about many instances where people at very young age have suffered serious health issues, uh, largely because of lifestyle. So how do we address the lifestyle? How do we reduce stress at workplace is a big challenge. You know, two things, you know, some of, some of us are focusing on how do you bring happiness back into workplace, and some of us are thinking about how do you reduce the stress levels. You know, you want to succeed, you want to grow, but how do you make a workplace that is less stressful? So we shifted our focus. One fine day, we said all our material benefits would just go out of the window. With a single stroke of decision, we said no more of these loan policies, no more of this uh, benefits like furniture, people would even buy curtains and all that, all kinds of things, laptops, cell phones. We did away with all that, car, everything, we did away with that. And then we said, what we'll do is we will use that same money. This is not to take away that money and save it for the company, but we'll use that same money to do a couple of very important things. One, increase the uh, medical insurance coverage. We did that almost, we increased it to twice the limit. So now you have more cover for you, you have better protection for you. Second, we said the annual health checkup policy, it used to be above 40 years, once in two years, we said forget it, you need to get it done every year now. And it's not just about you, what about your family? So we included the family also. So both you and your family can get it done. So that's how we started focusing on physical well-being. And then we have shifted to medical, uh, mental well-being. When we started our online counseling centers, etc., we had a physical counselors and all that, we would get about six to seven cases in a month. It went to about 50, 60 cases after some time. Today on an average, there are about 350, 360 cases. So we realize now this is another emerging trend. Increasingly, I strongly believe uh, that many organizations will continue to focus on health and wellness and also invest in creating workplaces which are very different from what it has been. Like we are today talking about building a new uh, large office space where we believe that's a place where you'll come and meet and greet. That's it. Okay. You know, the real work, you can work from anywhere, but the workplace here will be a place to meet and greet employees, to connect, to conduct meetings and all that. So we're investing in creating workplaces which will completely change the way traditional offices are. No more desk, no more workstations, etc. Places so, to meet so and greet. What we have uh, rightly pointed out is that uh, the whole workplace is changing. It's not just about the employee benefits, but also where the, the environment people work in. And so, uh, you also work with a uh, organization, EPL, SL, formerly known as SL Probat. You have worked with uh, Wipro. You have worked with Unilever. Large organizations, multi-location, uh, with uh, of course uh, decades of. Uh, a legacy behind them, and how do you are you addressing this challenge of evolving employee benefits? Sure. So first of all, I'm just so glad to be here and meeting many, many of you. So thank you so much, uh, and very warm welcome to everyone. <clears throat> I'll just talk a little bit about EPL because uh, you know many of you might not know. This is uh, SL ProPack. We are the world's largest special speciality uh, tube laminated tube manufacturing company. We have around 21 manufacturing locations across the world, and we have around 5,000 employees uh, across. If I were to say how many of you use Colgate toothpaste, so for example, every single tube of Colgate would be made by EPL. So if you see a small little petal, that's from EPL. And um, I'm, why am I sharing this? I'll just come to it in a couple of seconds. <clears throat> um, our own aim, because we are a tube manufacturing company, and we're very proud of it, so, but what is our aim and mission? Our mission is to really lead the world with sustainable packaging. What hence does it mean for us is we are one of the top 5%, 90,000 companies in the world who actually lead with sustainable practices. And we are sort of gold um, recognized across the world. Now, what does it mean for us? It also means for us, do we have our workforce which truly aligns, and it's a big shift I don't think it's something that we all have grown up with. It's a big shift to say, do we have our workforce who really understands and align with sustainability? And it's a shift in mindset, it's a shift in packaging processes, it's a shift in manufacturing and technology. And those individuals themselves should believe that we actually have people's sustainability in our organization. So that's the landscape that we are working with. 
Hence, what does it mean for us? So when I say very proudly that we are ECOVID is uh, gold-plated, uh, gold-rated, I think the most important point is <clears throat> it means that in every single manufacturing location, whether it's Colombia, whether it's Germany, whether it's Poland, whether it's Nalagar in uh, India, whether it's Egypt, or whether it is Mexico, we just don't abide by government laws, but are we doing enough to be one of the best manufacturing experiences that you give to your employees? Um, and I'll link it with the other question, if you're okay with that, uh, on DEI. So, for example, our, our entire workforce, including the contractual workforce, we have 44% uh, female population across the world, which is not very well known in our manufacturing setup, right? So, we are still sort of on the path and on the journey of, uh, of um, building a you know, diverse workforce. And recently, we've had uh, 32 of our colleagues who come from disabilities um, section of a society. And we have very, very clear, it's not a CSR, it's not a charity. Every single of them actually is very, very well equipped to do the job fantastically well. And hence, do we have our policies and practices to cater to the needs of different kind of workforce that we have across the world? Uh, it's a very capital intensive, I would say, a business model. We will have a business model of revenue, a bit, uh, you know, operational cost, but still can we provide people sustainability in all our practices end to end, which is not just linked to rewards and benefits. And that to me is very different, uh, you know, as a milestone for us to walk through as the workforce is changing. Because many of our workforce actually is not changing. We still have people who have spent 30, 35 years, their entire career uh, in the organization. So I don't think our workforce is changing. But our external landscape is changing. The customer expectation is changing. And, it's, and our own mission and values have changed to say we want to be the most sustainable packaging industry in the world. So for us, it's not the workforce only, but it's also the external landscape. And that changes. I think you, um, I think you pointed uh, a very interesting thing, Sonal, is that uh, you were talking about sustainability and your employees valuing sustainability. And I think this is something which is very organic to your line of business, so the work which you actually do. And becoming better and more responsible in that line of work is something which your employees are uh, valuing. Uh, now, uh, with Ganesh and Sonal, your organizations are more physically based. Uh, uh, you are more into manufacturing, etc. And th there are two gentlemen here who come from the media sector, Amit and uh, Alok. Now, uh, Amit, you are uh, see, you are from Z Media, Z Studio. Now, that is. Uh, something in the in line of entertainment business and you were, we were speaking on the sidelines and you said it's not just your employees but your off-role employees as well. So how are you managing both of these uh, work process which are right now on your payrolls and uh, contractual as well? So, uh, thank you Ganesh and Sonal for setting the context. Uh, I'll just take a step back. Uh, so uh, the way you look at benefits, uh, it's your own perspective would say. Benefits typically can be classified into two different buckets. One could be your tangible uh, benefits that uh, are there, and other would be your intangible benefits. When you talk about tangible benefits, it's typically what reflects in your comp structure, which you provide through the flexible uh, benefit bucket. And uh, the other tangible benefits could be your health insurance, your car subsidies, or your short-term, long-term finances, uh, so on and so forth. But today, if you look at the trend, a uh, lot of people would also look at the intangible benefits. And what would that be? Whenever an employee is joining a place or a workplace, he would definitely want to know how the culture of the organization is whether I'll fit into that culture, whether it will provide me the freedom for operations, whether it will provide me complete autonomy to work, whether they are ready to invest in me, whether they are bothered about my growth. So those are the intangible benefits which play a very, very crucial role. And at times in the list of benefits, we miss the culture bit which, is, which plays a very, very critical role today. 
in terms of uh, how we deliver these benefits, so uh, most of the organization, including Z, we have moved to a digital platform. What a digital platform typically does, it acts as an aggregator. And you or the employee has a centralized access to all the offerings at one place. So when you join the organization, you have your standard breakup. You go to the payroll portal through SSO. You select my pay, my choice. You have the liberty to design your own pay, looking at the flexible basket, what are the offerings that are available. You hop onto the insurance side. What happens there, the, employee, the company provides you insurance, uh, uh, the benefit to cover yourself, your spouse, and kids. But in case, looking at the juncture of your career, your life, where you are, you may, want to top, you may want to top up your policy. So you can opt in for that benefit. You can even opt in for your parental benefit. So these are the ways that you can look at. Again, using a digital platform makes the offerings much more personalized, I would say. And it becomes a self-service. When I say personalized, so there's a lot of AI tools which, uh, and typically all your offerings are picking up the data from your HRMS, and hence, you will only throw the right data to the person that he would be wanting, not a, a whole lot of data which will confuse him whether I pick this or that, whatever is relevant for him, looking at the gender, his age, his bracket, what, whatever he falls in, you will throw him the offerings. Self-service empowers him that he can do anything that he wants. Those things are also available on the go. So on the mobile, you can choose, do whatever you want. Also, when you move to a digital platform, it removes the entire administrative hassle. And also, your data is also protected. It is not floating around in papers across the office. I mean, nope. In That's fact, uh, I must point out that you and Z have got it exactly correct. In our survey, which we have not uh, displayed it here, in our survey we ask people what kind of digital, how do you prefer your employee benefits to be delivered? Human assistance or self-service or AI chatbot. Just a shade below half, 48% actually said they prefer self-service platforms or an AI-assisted chatbots to do it. So the trend is uh, totally changing. I think uh, it's also about the power, the control, what people want to have in their hand. It's also related to flexibility. And uh, Alok here, uh, I'm also talking about flexibility from your side. In fact, guys, uh, Alok is the head of employee experience at Bennett Coleman Company. And probably he's the most important man in, uh, in the Times Group right now because you are heading the employee experience. So Alok, this flexible work arrangement, how is it working for you in this media company? Uh, see, let's, uh, in the, we are in the post-pandemic era. And let's understand what has changed from the old ways prior to pandemic, what happened during the pandemic. See, overnight, we all went home, worked from home, no hassles, no productivity loss if you recall 2020 when the pandemic hit and everybody was there. Human race ability to adapt to the crisis was humongous. And we swiftly changed to that one. If you look at what was at the core was the crisis. A crisis induced that adaptability very easily. But then as it eased out, because there was a threat to life and there was a threat to livelihood, as this threat uh, reduced, two things happened. People went back to preference and convenience. We all are driven by preference and convenience. And this is what started happening again. But they have tasted the blood. And they have tasted the blood of working from anywhere. Now in the new era, what is happening? Employees' focus is to get the flexibility, get the convenience. But what, as, the, as that crisis went, the focus shifted, people started integrating work and life together, and the anxiety in the managerial hierarchy increased. So what the whole uh, industry has done, all most of the industry has done, they are calling people back to office. Why this shift from saying that we will be 75% hybrid to back to office? These kind of changes we are seeing in the post-pandemic era. Where does flexibility play the role now? 
the question that we need to ask to decide on this one. Because no one solution will fit uh, for everybody. Forget about the industry, forget about a company also. It will be more at a business process level. The question that we need to ask about flexibility is, what, do you, what does your business process require? Does it require a human touch, human interaction? And decide the level of flexibility you want to give to a particular team based on that one. Is it impacting the customer? You can't deal with your customer. You can't influence his buying decision sitting in your home through a, a, a remote call, through a team call. You have to be with him. You have to live his life to influence his buying decisions. Same way, when you have to influence employee behavior, you have to be on the floor with the people, maneuvering them in their moments of work life that matters. Only these are the things which require physical presence. But we are, all are human beings. So we have to play, as a HR, we have to play a balance between what, how much flexibility we have to give and how much engagement we have to get. So see, we are a media company. Traditionally, every day your morning starts with a paper and a cuppa. And every day you get amazed, you get hooked on to the content. And every day minded, you get a new content. Our product is made every day. Now, this doesn't happen. This requires immense amount of creativity as a DNA in the organization, DNA in the content team. But they can't work remotely. They, they delivered during the pandemic remotely. But now that we have to bring that back, we have to hook the customer back to the print they have to create the same magic. And for that, they need to be together. So business process defines. But if I have to, uh, another uh, functions or another team where the work is happen, uh, happening at an individual level or at a process level, at a system level, why not give the flexibility? But yes, you have to deal with the workplace, multiple workplace in the same organizations. The workplace dynamics and understanding has changed. There is no single type of workplace in any organization anymore. We have to foster multiple varieties of workplace in the same organizations with different teams. It, will, it is a difficult task, but that's where the critical role HR has to play. So this, that's a unique perspective. In fact, Lalok, I'm hearing that there is no one workplace. It's not a monolith. Uh, ultimately, there are several workplaces within the same, uh, same uh, roof. And I picked up on one of the things you mentioned about creativity and innovation that has to be maintained. So uh, while uh, Ganesh spoke about uh, extending health benefits, etc., to the employee as well as their family. Um, and uh, Sonal spoke about sustainability, something which is more in line with their work. And Amit spoke about uh, digital delivery of those benefits. Uh, but when it comes to creativity, it's a very, very people-centric thing. And uh, uh, here, uh, I would like to uh, invite views of uh, uh, Rita. Uh, in fact. Uh, because Rita is the president and head HR of DDB Mudra Group. Now that is advertising which, and creativity is its fuel. Uh, advertising, media planning, etc. In fact, uh, Mr. Piyush Pandey recently said that advertising is the most exciting field. And that is also because it involves those people who really need to be motivated, excited, innovative all the time. So for you, diversity is a very important component. And I think that's always been said that in advertising, you find people from all walks of life. Mr. Piyush Pandey himself was a cricketer, came from construction and whatnot. Uh, so we also, in this poll, asked people about what really makes a diverse and a more inclusive workplace. So when we asked people uh, there, uh, can we switch to that? Yeah. So we asked people what makes a future workplace more inclusive. So the options were whether it's a 40-hour or a four-day work week, uh, is it benefits to the unorthodox caregivers, is it cultural inclusivity, uh, equal opportunities for able and specially able, uh, health insurance covering LGBTQIA benefits, uh, mental health benefits. So uh, in our panel, and in fact, uh, Rita especially, what do you think would be the most popular or people said the most impactful factors for creating an inclusive workplace? Uh, I think definitely cultural inclusivity would be the first one, according to me. Uh, it's going to be equal opportunities, uh, again, for, I mean, I wouldn't just say abled and specially able, but I think for everyone, that's uh, the uh, other bit. And I would also say mental health benefits uh, would be an important aspect. Yeah. Uh, uh, Salji, uh, Dev, any thoughts? 
Yes, uh, for me too. The first one, the culturally inclusivity and mental health benefits, I will go one step ahead and talk about more of well-being. Yeah. So since I have been in HR and recruitment is a part of our role, a lot of uh, candidates which I have interviewed, they have left their jobs because of mental work stress. And that's the key now, Gener uh, the Generation Y and Z, all are very focusing on the complete takeaway of well-being. Others, component like salary and tangible benefits are part of every organization. If our organizations are promoting well-being, that will be the key takeaway. So we, sh the coming future, all the HR should really be focusing on the mental well-being and holistic well-being of the person. So let us see what then the employees have said. The biggest is 55% of the respondents, mental health benefits actually are the most impactful, they, are, they consider as most impactful. And you, that you have rightly said, and the, then there is flexible work week, cultural inclusivity as you rightly said, uh, Rita. So uh, Rita, coming to you, uh, these are the top ones and you have got it right. So what is uh, DDB Mudra, what are you implementing there to make it a more inclusive workplace? So uh, just a background, again, DDB Mudra, it's Mudra Advertising for some of you who really want to know. And we are obviously into the advertising space, marketing communications. Uh, our talent workforce, you know, as you rightly said, is, it's, is a mixture of, you know, people from different avenues. We are dealing with people with different generations. And of course, maximum of our workforce is millennials and now it's becoming Gen Zs. Uh, and they bring in a very different perspective in terms of how they are, you know, looking at work as such, right? I mean, for them, work has to be meaningful. And I think that's one thing when, even when you interview them, they, the first thing is that we want to do meaningful work. Now, meaningful work, again, is different for each person. So you have to really understand what are their needs and kind of, you know, help them build their careers basis that. So that's one important uh, aspect which we are seeing in our workforce. And, but of course, in terms of, uh, you know, from a diverse workforce, we also have to then look at diverse benefits, right? I mean, it's, it's as simple like, you know, you have different mobile plans and different plans for OTT. We, we know we are reaching a stage where we have to start giving options to our employees and not just come up with, you know, one set of benefits saying that, you know, you kind of have to choose from there. So some different things which we've done is, uh, so there was this an entire, uh, you know, thing in the industry about, uh, you know, period leave. Now, again, I'm not getting into the debate of is it right or wrong, but what we did as an organization, uh, again, after, you know, talking to different workforce, which included men and women, and we did a lot of focus group sessions, was, uh, you know, we realized that the need is about giving an option to everyone. And, you know, one of the strong points was that why only period leave? Then what about men? I mean, it's not that they don't have health issues, right? So what we implemented was a welfare leave, you know, to what you were saying that welfare is going to be, you know, an important thing. And we are not uh, kind of defining that it has to be a backache, it has to be a migraine, it has to be period, it could be anything, it could be mental health also. So we have a wellness leave where people can, you know, pick and choose. They don't even have to, you know, kind of uh, tell the organization that what is the leave they're taking, but they have an option to take it, you know, as and when they want. So that's one thing which we kind of implemented and, you know, it kind of worked quite well for us because Again, everybody felt inclusive about it, and this benefit was not just focused on women, and it was focused to everyone in the organization. The other bit, again, you know, when it came to festival leaves, and again, traditionally, you know, you had this set of holidays which, you know, you kind of give an, you know, an organization year on year. And now again, earlier it was okay if, you know, uh, some festivals were not given leave, and I mean, I'm not specifying those, right? But Today, again, even if there is one person in the organization, they'll come up and ask you that, how come this leave wasn't covered? So that also we've kind of given up, you know, so we have fixed leave, which are obviously as per the national holiday list. But again, there's flexibility to choose when do you want to take leave for which, you know, festival, for which religion, because we are not forcing people to take that. Now, those are some things we've just started off and we, you know, realize that people are appreciative about it. But again, the pressure is back on the organization because where, you know, earlier, like a big celebration would happen, you know, say for a Diwali or Christmas. Now, for every festival, people are expecting us to do something. So 
it's something you have to keep on thinking and keep on uh, you know exploring in terms of that so that's more in terms of the benefits from that aspect and again on insurance uh, you know as uh, you know somebody was just talking about it so we are in fact one of the first agencies who implemented uh, you know insurance for the uh, same sex partners so that's something which we had kind of implemented 3 years back and it was really kind again quite appreciated in the industry because uh, again you know we didn't want to specify that you know insurance has to be only for a spouse it could be for any partner it could be for a live in partner and we don't want to define that it's up to the employee and you know we've kind of kept it open over there so some uh, different uh, you know strategies we've been trying to look at from our uh, you know benefit point of views of course we have a uh, you know flexibility in terms of the compensation so people can choose you know what components they want but uh, yeah i think we are also evolving a lot in terms of what we can do from a benefit perspective and try and be more inclusive uh, you know and kind of you know uh, also keep on asking for options because we don't have all the answers uh, and i think one another important thing especially from you know the dni perspective was we hired like uh, again the first transgender intern like in the industry we are the first uh, of you know the people who kind of did that again not an easy thing we we thought it's it's a cake walk because we've done sensitization sessions and people are open to it but the first thing you know when we had uh, you know the company whom we've kind of partnered with which is hamsafar trust and they you know they walked into the organization and they asked us that have you done training programs and we said yes we've done for our senior management for our employees and they said but you didn't do it for your security guards or your pantry guys because they are the ones who actually turned around and gave a look you know to uh, to the people who enter and it was quite embarrassing but that's a reality you know you you're not really still well prepared infrastructure wise again when they did an audit they realized we don't have a unisex washroom and again they asked us so then you know what are you where, where do you think you know they what washroom will they use so we had to start thinking of you know very different ways of kind of approaching that so it's not just about you hiring a person and saying okay we've done that but how are we making the workplace inclusive and they don't feel awkward that you know they have to ask that which washroom do they have to go to you know in terms of interactions if people should not turn around and give them a look or comments should not be made right so yeah so i think our initial uh, steps in that area and i'm sure you know as we go along the journey there's a lot more which we'll kind of cover uh, over there really so uh, as you rightly pointed out uh, and uh, inclusivity is not really a checklist uh, it involves a lot of orientation but a lot of preparation and uh, it's a journey which i think every organization should uh, now cover and uh, and moving on to dev now dev i think chai point must be the youngest organization uh, as far as this panel is concerned and it's a startup uh, and it's a very vibrant startup and with startups there are different expectations of employees on how the startup culture would be so what have you seen as far as employee benefits what are they demanding how is it changing uh so first of all i like the setup we are two business guys sitting and in between we have people leader here guiding us through the way uh what we believe at chai point is uh we look at three c's of any culture which is chai coffee and culture okay and why i say this is because uh, most of the responses that we are seeing here at least in this survey a lot of it is stemming away out of the organization culture or the culture the organization is trying to build i understand in board rooms people might strictly be professional but the real culture is built in the hallways and the pantries and around uh, sipping a cup of chai the inclusivity starts there the mental well being starts there the inclusion of ideas and thoughts starts there you are not restricted you are in an environment where you are not afraid that's the real culture and that's what we believe in and that's the culture that we are trying to build in our organization and whenever we get an opportunity to uh, meet the people leader or admin leaders at our client side this is what we also tell them that this beverage is not just a beverage which people would thank you for it's a life changing beverage and a experience changing beverage for them so we are the partners who provide the experience and who have, who set a stage for building the culture for any organization i'll i'll give you a very small example a pretty small example and even we didn't realize when we were doing it uh we as an organization believe in sustainability we as an organization believe in doing business which is good for people good for planet so when we started offering the service in offices we thought that lot of chai rather 70% of tea consumption happens outside home it happens at stores at roadside shops or in offices okay 
what is it that we can do to make this beverage and experience better for everyone who's having it? We started looking at health benefits. Obviously, taste is given. No one is going to take the beverage if taste is not good, OK? We signed up for sustainable sourcing of tea, starting from there, OK? We only source single origin, trusty certified teas. What would that mean? That means that the chemical usage is limited. It's sustainably produced. People there are getting the right wage. Child labor is not involved. So that's the culture. That's what we are building, OK? Then we said that how can we use sweeteners which are less evil? And I'm using my words carefully. I know I can't say sweeteners are good, OK? But which are less evil. Uh, so the option, obviously, the largest option is sugar. So we said, no, we'll not use the regular sugar. We'll use sulfur-free sugar. And we'll give an option of honey. We'll give an option of jaggery. Honey still might be expensive, but jaggery is still affordable, OK? And recently, in one of the town halls, in one of my large client organization, some of the clients stood up and thanked the HR, saying that you have changed our lives because we have now started using jaggery in houses. Okay? And it is a very small thing, and we didn't realize that we'll be able to make that big an impact in someone's life. Our mission was, our objective was to make sure that we are serving the good product there, but that resulted in a culture building, a larger culture building. Now think of it. That employee's family is using that, that product. Okay? Uh, moving on from there, Another thing that we are also looking at is the productivity unlock. And we get this feedback a lot. Okay, Now, why we want chai in our office, and this was an interesting discussion I was just having with a with few of the uh, panel members here. And they were telling me that a lot of time we see a lot of people going down to the roadside shop, and they don't go alone. That's the culture here. When we go out for a chai or we go out for a break, we take a couple of colleagues along. Okay, And then they go, and 20, 30 minutes are spent there. If you can get that in office, that's a big productivity unlock. Okay? At the same time, you give that forum not only to those two, three people, but a larger set of people to be a part of that discussion, that bonding to happen. Because every benefit that we talk about here, I'm sure most of our organizations are offering it. And if we are not, we are learning from each other, we'll start offering it. But what is important is the culture. Every organization would have a different culture. That's the differentiating factor. That's what is going to drive people back to office. That's what is going to make people bond and stay in organization longer. We have had so many cases. We are a young organization, as you said. And uh, when people leave us, and people do leave us, go to larger organizations, and the great thing is when they come back to us and tell us that's the one thing that we are missing is obviously the culture. I'm getting more money. I'm getting great benefits, but I'm missing the culture here. And there are so many cases when people went to the larger organizations have come back. And just one last point on the culture. Uh, for us, uh, what's supreme is the quality and taste of the beverage. As I said, no one is going to even get us in the organization if you're not doing that job. So we, have, we put a lot of emphasis on training. And not only training our own team, training even the pantry staff at our client side. Then we started certifying them. We didn't realize that they are going to value it as much, but they are, gonna, they, are, they are valuing it. And now we are working with the NSDC to make it a formal certification for the pantry boys. Now, think of it. In that person's life, as, as you were rightfully mentioning, ma'am, that uh, that's the toughest nut to crack when you are talking about inclusivity, when you're talking about diversity. If we don't train them, if we don't get them to the same page, then probably the organization might might miss that culture. So uh, that's that's what I think. Culture, about. of course, uh, it all boils down to culture, and people also have rated the culture as uh, one of the major things. And in fact, uh, uh, on the other end of this uh, stage, uh, Dun and Bradstreet is uh, over 180 years old, and we have Tata's also, which is more than a century old. And Ganesh, uh, a lot of it is about the culture which Tata's have built over a period of time. It is known for its. Uh, caring for its uh, employees. Uh, I think they feel more like family. But it's also a lot about communicating these benefits to the employees. So with such a large organization, how do you, how do you manage that? It takes a lot of effort. And uh, many times we take it for granted and we believe culture is something that's brewing up on its own. That's not the case. A lot of focused, sustained, efforts goes into not only building the culture, but also sustaining the culture. For example, uh, 
some of the core aspects of our culture, how we treat people, how we engage with people is very, very important. And unfortunately, we come in industry, uh, we operate in a sector which is not known for best people practices. You shout at people, you scream at people to get work done at various project sites, uh, using harsh language, abusive language is, is kind of taking it for granted, etc. So this sector is really not known for treating people well, uh, people nicely, etc. But for us, it's very important. So every single case of even using harsh language, shouting and screaming, can have serious consequences. I mean, I've seen people losing out on their promotions or uh, inclusion into any of our uh, uh, long-term incentive plan simply because of their bad behavior. And when we take such decisions, we clearly articulate that. You know, you could have progressed, you could have done well, but because of your abusive nature or because of the language you use, you lost out on those benefits. Integrity is very important. And again, everyone knows that. Tata stands for integrity in business ethics. So every single case of any integrity is taken up very seriously, investigated, and dealt with very firmly in a very time-bound manner. So anything that you value in your culture beyond uh, communication, mm -hmm. the true test of it is that do you see it in action? Or do you simply see uh, the good part of your culture put on your walls everywhere, posters, banners, etc., or do you see it live in your uh, organization? So for us, Experiencing our culture is more important than what we write on the wall or what we put on the frame. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not getting into details, but a good part of our time and effort, our energy just goes into sustaining it, protecting what it is. And we tell everyone that if you can't add value to it, don't destroy it, don't do damage to it, just leave it as it is. We'll take care of it. But it's very, very important for us. Cool. Thank you. Uh, with this last note, I thank all the panelists, in fact, quite uh, uh, interesting ones on uh, how to build that culture, what are the employee benefits, and in fact, uh, it's kind of heartening that uh, all the panelists have got it right on what really employees want. And uh, uh, this is something which uh, the workforce has evolved, the workplace has evolved, and uh, uh, like Amit mentioned, the use of technology has increased, like Alok mentioned that there are several workplaces uh, uh, inside one workplace. So this is a different ecosystem what HR leaders and technology leaders, business leaders are dealing with. And with that, I thank the audience for being there and thank you panelists for sharing your insights. We just have to give the mementos. Am I on? Yes, I am. All right, thank you so much, panelists, for such an insightful discussion today. And uh, may I request Mr. Vipul Oberoi to present some mementos to all our panelists. Can we have a huge round of applause for, our, for such a bright panel discussion today? Can we have the applause going? Yes, a thunderous applause so that we start shaking on stage. Can we do that? I see a very energetic crowd here, so I'm sure you can do better than that, right? Can we have the applause going for all our panelists?
Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien.